Hello everybody, my name is Professor from Morning Bear and Berry Science Lab. Welcome to History of Science Part 2. Now, today, we're also out in the snow, but all of the snow on the sidewalk is gone. <laughs> it's no longer a winter wonderland anymore. But still, today we will be talking about the history of science. Now, last time, we left you off on Sir Isaac Newton. Now, who could be the successor of such a great mind? Ah, yes, it was a... Uh, 40-year-old mathematically illiterate um, British mathematician or British physicist? I mean, how do you comprehend that? Now, he was named Michael Faraday. Michael Faraday was a British physicist who was illiterate completely until the age of 14. At that time, he was taught reading and writing from a church school. Now... Michael Faraday did not have much formal education. He got most of his education from a great prominent scientist and chemist of the time, Sir Humpty Dumpty Davy, or I mean Humphrey, Humphrey Davy, not Humpty Dumpty, Humphrey Davy. So the thing was, Humphrey Davy allowed Michael Faraday to go on a tour all around continental Europe, where there were people like Alessandro Volta or Ampere, there were so many great and esteemed scientists that he was able to meet and learn from. That was one of the pivotal things that allowed Michael Faraday to grow to one of the cornerstones of physics. Now, I'm sure Humphrey Davy, he got a quite severe case of the death nine days after having a stroke. And so, so and so Michael Faraday instead opted towards electromagnetism and electromagnetism well electricity and magnetism were seen as two separate subjects at the time however michael faraday was one of the key people who was going who were going to unify it now he one day in 1831 when he was 40 as i said in 1831 he was he took a magnet and put it through a coin and voila the thing that he had been dreaming of waiting for he saw that magnetism the moving of a magnet the creation of a magnetic field could create electricity that was one of the biggest achievements and, and so this is what we remember michael faraday for the, one of the first and key builders of the bridge between electricity and magnetism. That bridge eventually became something new, a uniting factor, which made electricity and magnetism become electromagnetism. Now, this was the discovery that he called induction. However, unlike many others on this list, Michael Faraday was amazing in math. Uh, sorry, sorry, I, I, I was lying. I didn't mean amazing. I meant absolutely horrible at math. He never got any formal education. And the only education he did get was from Sir Humphrey Davy, not a mathematician, a chemist. Thus, he could not translate his little induction stuff into math. Just like when you have dots, you can't spill them out into words. And so, that was a job left for James Clerk Maxwell, who was one of the biggest figures in physics. He was the one who united both electricity and magnetism under one, ba I mean, one subject. And so, what was, what were this, this legendary tool that he used to destroy any previous semblance of dis disconnection and create one unified subject that would determine the future of physics from now on. He used four equations, three of which he stole from others. Okay, okay, okay. Not really stole, but he used them to make an inference that electricity, an electric field, can create a magnetic field. A magnetic field can create an electric field. And this was the link between electricity and magnetism he had been waiting for. Specifically, it came in the fourth equation. The fourth equation he didn't fully steal. 
He actually made a revit hit, but he stole parts of it from Ampere still. What a robber! Forget him, burglar. Now we've got a Quentin burglar over here. So, now, what do we, now what was this mystical equation? Well, this equation basically said that a magnetic, uh, an electric field can be uh, created, yeah, sure, from the usual stuff, but it can also be created by a magnetic field. It can not only be created by current, like I or stuff like that. It could also be created by B, the magnetic field. And so, that, once and for all, unified all of electricity and magnetism. Now, how did he find this out? Well, he thought, I mean, you are generating an electric field. So let's say you generate an electric field and you have a wire carrying current, but in the, between these wires, there are like two metal disks, two magnets, or two things. And now you think that because there is no wire over there, no wire carrying current, then that would mean that there would be no electric field in the middle of those two things. But there is an electric field. But why? And that seemingly, uh, and that was the thing, that was the factor that unified all of electricity and magnetism. One unlikely scenario. James Clerk Maxwell paved the path for Albert Einstein. One of the part, one of, if not the biggest scientist in physics. Uh, the biggest, who had the biggest influence in all of physics beyond. And he, and his theories, the theory of relativity, both special and general, it would change our view of physics forever. Now, he was born in 1879, and it never seemed like he was going to be a child prodigy. In fact, he was a late speaker. He didn't speak until the age of five. He was born in 1879, but it turned out that he would quickly blossom from there. In 1905, when he was 25 years old and a head hurdle, unknown patent clerk, he wrote down. Now, he was a patent clerk meaning that he would be judging if these inventions or mecha uh, the, these mechanical inventions and contraptions were original, if they were copied, if they were legitimate, they would work, and then um, the, whoever patented it would get the copyright for it. However, he was sitting there wondering, one day, would he ever make an original thought of his own? And indeed he did. 1905 is Annus Mirabilis. He published four papers. Now, the most important one of those, special relativity. The second most important one was the photoelectric effect, which won him the Nobel Prize, but uh, let's not talk about them. So, we have special relativity. Now, what was this huge thing, special relativity? Well, two things. One, it dictated that light had the same speed from all observers' perspectives, all reference frames. And two, the laws of physics are the same for every single person that's not accelerating. That's why it's called special relativity, because it only applies to things that are moving at constant velocity or at rest. However, what about general relativity? General relativity, as you would expect, generalizes this theory for literally everything, including accelerating bodies. Now, with this, you can predict that moving at light speed would be a bit weird. And while moving at light speed, le uh, length would contract. You would measure length as shorter because time would dilate. Time would seem to get longer and shorter from others' perspectives. And so, that's called time dilation. And so there are all these wacky effects of traveling at light speed. And this is all because 
light speed is the same from every observer's perspective. Now, second thing, it also predicts it also predicts many things about black holes. The first of which was discovered, um, sadly, a bit after Einstein died. And the first one had a full, uh, the first one who, which had a photograph taken of it was discovered in April of 2019, which is surprisingly recent. Which just shows how much we don't know about the universe. But this, but. This special relativity, this general relativity, predicted black holes, which were objects that were extremely small, but very gravitationally significant. It predicted relativistic momentum, relativistic length, relativistic time. It predicted that simultaneity wasn't real, or rather was only real because at one, at different perspectives or at specific reference frames. So for example, um, if you're a man, uh, if you're a conductor, and you see that if you're a guy um, who, if you have a train passing by and you're a guy just sitting on the side of the road, then you, and you saw that two lightning bolts struck the train at the same time on both ends, if the conductor was at another point or say closer to one point of the train than another he would see that those things weren't simultaneous rather the one that was closer to him came first and then the one that was farther away from him came after and so this is general and special relativity it gave us a huge revolution in science in fact, it also predicted that mass could be converted to energy and vice versa. In fact, mass could be converted to a lot of energy. In fact, I might have so, uh, like the energy of a nuclear bo- a hundreds of nuclear bombs bouncing around in me right now. And I can calculate that, in fact, using the equation E equals mc squared. It's constant. See? is always constant, um, 3.8 or, or approximately 4 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and you also have, actually, I mean 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, approximately, and you have the energy output, so the energy output of me is equal to my mass times the square of the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 raised to the 8th power. So there's really just a constant and a variable, which makes it extremely simple to calculate how much energy might be bouncing around in me right now. You can do it, in fact. I'm approximately 30 kilograms, and so you could convert that. So you take 30, then multiply that by 9 times 10 to the 16, and boom! You get, well, 2.7 times 10 to the 19 joule inside of me right now. Now, these were all insane predictions, but the crazy thing, Einstein was proven right. Time dilation, by the way, just a note, um, also happens not only when you're traveling at a relativistic speed, but also happens when you're near a very gravitationally significant body, like, for example, a black hole. Now, this. Now, he was proven correct, in fact, Do to some extremely precise atomic clocks and some extremely precise measurements. And so, Einstein, however, was not was a staunch opponent of quantum mechanics. He once said, in fact, God did not play dice. Now, he wasn't a religious believer. He didn't really believe in any sort of God. He didn't have any personal gods, per se. His imagination of God was somebody who just created the laws and let the universe run on its own. However, he meant that there was, he meant God did not play dice. It's, well, a statement to say how bizarre quantum mechanics was, that it couldn't possibly be true. Quantum mechanics, speaking of, quantum mechanics, basically, now, what is the sense? What is the tr- what is the sense? What is the meaning of does not play dice? Well, 
the central meaning of the central thing in quantum mechanics is that you cannot calculate where a particle could, uh, could be at a specific time. You cannot calculate exactly where a particle will be. You can only predict the probability of it being at a specific location at a specific time. Only the probability. And well, dice are related to probability, so God did not say dice. It makes sense, doesn't it? So, speaking of quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics to the public is like, ooh, fussy stuff, new particles, double slits. But in reality, it's not that way. Now, this is a gross oversimplification. But basically, quantum mechanics says that you can only predict the position of a subatomic particle. You can only predict the position of a subatomic particle, like a baryon. You can only predict the probability of it being at this position at this time. You cannot predict where it will be. It's kind of like a fan, as I've heard in an analogy once. You can't really predict where the three fans will be. However, um, well, you can't really predict where the three fan blades will be. However, you'll definitely know that they're in the fan if you, I don't know, stick your finger in or something. So, this is the idea of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics also has, well, the Heidenberg's uncertainty principle. Um, well, it, what, where does its namesake come from? Werner Heisenberg. Well, what does Heisenberg's uncertainty principle say? It says that you can't measure the velocity and the position of particle at the same time without altering those attributes. And so, that means that we will always be uncertain of both the position and velocity of an object at a specific time. If we are aware of both the position and the velocity of something at a specific time, we will be able to predict the universe. And so, now, this is the idea of quantum mechanics. However, there is a big problem in, the, in our current model of physics. Quantum mechanics and general relativity are not compatible with each other. So, one or the other must be wrong in some way. And so, maybe Albert Einstein was right and that God does not play dice. Or maybe Albert Einstein was wrong with his theory of relativity. We will never know. We will never know until one of you watching this video or otherwise. Maybe me, maybe you sitting right there on the other side of the screen. Maybe you or me, one day, someone will discover the link between quantum mechanics and general relativity. Maybe then we can finally unite it into quantum gravity. Maybe we will get another revolution like the one that James Clerk Maxwell and Michael Faraday brought on in the 19th century. Maybe even you could instigate that revolution. Together, we can turn the world of physics upside down. Thank you. Brought to you by Brilliant.org. The Bari Science Lab to fall in love with math and science.